Welcome to this edition of the Rainer Report. You know what? Of course, you don't know what because that's a rhetorical question. But here's the what. I absolutely love pastors. Absolutely love church staff. I, I just, I, I have a heart, and I guess part of it is empathy because I have been a pastor. I have served as a pastor for churches. Or perhaps the, the relationship that I have with pastors through my blog at TomRainer.com or, or my podcast at Rainer on Leadership or Revitalize and Replant uh, podcast or the thousands that are at Church Answers. I've just loved my relationship with pastors and with church leaders. And I know that I'm sometimes empathetic to a fault where I, I am just, I champion them and their cause. But I do know this. I do know that pastors and other church staff and their families go through a lot. And over the course of years, I've been able to listen and to glean and sometimes to even do statistical surveys where we ask these questions. What is it that's really bugging you, pastor? What is it that's really bringing you down? And so what I want to do in this Rainer Report is to just share with you five of the consistent sources of discouragement for pastors. Now, I want to be clear that these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. But the word consistent here is a key word. These are the type of things that I hear repeatedly. There will be other things that I've written about or that I've spoken about that will be in other areas of discouragement for the pastor. But in these five, these are like the gnats that they cannot slap. They're just constantly making that little sound and going around and around. And it's part of what it means to be a pastor or a church staff person or to be a family member of one of these pastors or staff persons as well. So allow me to go through each of these five and just to expand upon it a little bit with the hope that when it's all said and done, you will know if you're not a pastor, how to pray for your pastor and for your staff even more. What are five consistent sources of discouragement for pastors? The first one here is members fighting with each other. A few days ago, I was talking to a pastor, and I asked this question, how did your day go? Silence. Well, that was an answer in itself. He said, tell me about it. And the pastor said, oh, I have been refereeing some church members. I said, what do you mean by refereeing? Even though I knew the implications. He said, they are at it with one another. It's about each of them, them getting their way. It's two on this side and two on the other. And, and they, they are causing so much disunity in the church with their fighting. And they, even though he didn't put it this way, he says, they're draining me. And, and I think about... When, when there's this infighting, you remember when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi that he had so much to say about his love for the church at Philippi, and he, he told him to rejoice in the Lord always, again rejoice, and then he said, uh, oh, I want to talk to you about Yodi and Syntyche. And uh, you know, you know you've got to bring them together. You, they, they're fighting. You, 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 they're, they're, they're destroying the unity of the church. They're hurting the church. And I heard from this pastor, and he said, I wish I had every minute back that I spent refereeing for gospel intentionality and it's just a drain on me to have to deal with this fighting. Well, it's not only bad for the pastor, it's bad for the entire church. But pastors say this to me on a repeated basis. Members fighting with each other. That is a source of constant discouragement for me. Another one is this. Criticism and bullying. Now, here's the reality. If you're not being criticized, you are not leading. Because if you are leading, you will lead change. If you lead change, you will be criticized because many people like things the way they are. Criticism is a dose of reality. If you could have known the context in which I was in, I just got word just, just minutes before this recording of a criticism that was coming toward me or my organization, and it was just, you know, just one of those deflators, and I just, just said this, all right, this is the price of leadership. It's a reality. I have to deal with that reality in the context of where I am, but pastors do too. But for pastors, it's constant. Everybody, that's a stretch statement, exaggeration, but everybody seems to have a better way to do it. Pastor, if you would preach this. Pastor, if you would preach this long. Pastor, if you would lead this way. Pastor, if you would do this ministry. Pastor, if we would stop doing this ministry. Pastor, if you would come to this meeting. Pastor, why didn't you come to this meeting? Pastor, I wanted you to counsel me. Pastor, why weren't you there for this particular event that was just for women and you're a man? And the list could go 
own it, own. They're hearing the criticism, but there's one higher level than criticism. It's bullying. And bullying can come passively, aggressively, or it can come in overt attacks. But there are sometimes some people in the church that just are determined that they are going to bulldoze their way no matter what. Many times they try to force the pastor out or they try to force an issue to their conclusion. I've been around pastors who've been bullied and it's a very painful thing. I know of one pastor that just made the decision for the sake of the church that he wasn't going to fight the bully because he thought it would be too divisive so he left on his own. Shame on that bully. Shame on the way that that church let that happen. Criticism and bullying. A third constant little gnat source of discouragement for pastors are comparisons. Pastor, have you listened to this podcast? It's a really good sermon. Now, the implication is, wow, I finally got to listen to a good sermon. Or, or pastor, you need to hear how this person treated that text that you preached on today. Translation, I have a better way because I can compare. Hey, pastor, have you heard what's happening at such and such church? And if he hears that enough, he's going to realize that the underlying message, if not the overt message, is our church isn't measuring up. What's wrong with you, pastor? Why aren't you providing the kind of leadership that could cause us to be the kind of church that that church is? But I can assure you at that church, they have some members that are saying the same thing to their pastor, that are comparing their pastor to other churches as well. A fourth one, the expectation of omnipresence. I have said this to pastors many times. Look, I've got the simple way for you to do pastoring and just be the greatest pastor in the world. You need to be omnipotent, all-powerful. You need to be omnipresent. That means you need to be everywhere at the same time, and you need to be omniscient. You need to know exactly what everybody's thinking. Why can't you do that? Why can't you be all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present? Of course, I say that tongue-in-cheek because people expect us to know things. Why didn't you visit me in the hospital? I didn't know you were in the hospital. Uh, why, why didn't you call me when I went through this, through this issue? I didn't know you were going through this issue. Well, you should have. You know, that's, that's omniscience. And, and then omnipotence. Pastor, why haven't you taken care of this? Well, I do not have supernatural powers. I'm not omnipotent. But then there's omnipresence. Everybody expects the pastor to be at where they want to be. And so it all adds up. And I, I did the survey one time in a church where I was pastor. I pastored the 12 deacons. I mean, I, I surveyed the 12 deacons. And I, I said, put the minimum amount of time that I need to be involved in these categories. And, 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 and I said, if there's a category that I didn't mention, you just, you just put it down. Well, they, they, they listed all the, the things that I should be doing at a minimum. At a minimum amount of time, you should do this much sermon preparation, hospital visitation, counseling. And I said, if I didn't put something there, put it there. Well, here's, and these were 12 good deacons. Well, at least 11 of them were. The other was a Judas. I guess anytime you have 12, you have at least one Judas. But for the most part, these were good deacons. But to live up to the expectations of just 12, I had to spend about 180 hours a week working. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I couldn't see my family. And I still didn't have enough time because for the uninitiated, there are only 168 hours in the week. That was just with 12 people. And churches, they are constantly hearing, why weren't you there? I needed you there. Sometimes you need to be there. But my goodness, the expectations of omnipresence are powerful and painful. The final one is losing members. You know, when somebody in our church moves to another church in the community, it's hard as a pastor not to take it personally. It's hard as a pastor not to ask why we have failed. And it happens to every pastor. And I guess that, you know, it's going to always happen. But it is really painful, when, especially when church members leave just because they aren't getting their way, when many of the times they have never given of themselves. So I know these are negative issues, but I want you to hear them. These are five consistent sources of discouragement for pastors, members fighting with each other, criticism and bullying, comparison issue, expectation of omnipresence, and losing members. And I thank you for being here on Rainer Reports. Give me a like, follow, uh, friend me, just be with me on Facebook because we're going to continue to come back on a regular basis and I'll see you in the next edition of Rainer Reports.